I was beginning to think that he was actually talking about somebody else then, so I was waiting for them to get up. Um, before I start, um, I'm actually going to do something totally outside the box because um, you've had about 11 presentations today on various aspects of mail and logistics and everything else. So with some of the issues that have come up, I'm actually going to talk about how you might actually solve some of those issues within your own organization. So before I start, could anybody, could you raise your hand if you know anything at all about the organizational life cycle concept? No, that's great, because now I can tell you anything and you won't be any the wiser. Um, let me tell you about the... Um, oh, sorry. Wrong one. There you go. What I'm going to talk about today is Thrive Don't Just Survive, and that will involve talking about what does it take to be a high-performing organization. Every living entity has a life cycle. Organizations are just the same. Here's an example of the biological life cycle. People are born, they go through infancy, they become toddlers, they go through adolescence, and eventually that's a monster stage for any of you that have got kids, and move to prime, the prime of life. Eventually the fall, become a little bit older and get over the hill. Move into old age, golden age, move to Florida. If you can afford it, maybe come down to Coral Gables, and then eventually death. So that's the living entity uh, life cycle theory. That actually maps very well against the corporate or the organizational structure and the life cycles that every company goes through. Now what I'm going to tell you over the next 15, 20 minutes is independent of culture, uh, it's independent of country, of size of company. It's not chronological, so you can be 100 years young and five years old. And it's actually, these concepts and techniques are now used in about 73 countries and through, with thousands of different companies all over the world, um, from startups to multi-billion dollar corporations. So let's have a look at the organizational life cycle. As I said before, the, the aspect is to get to prime. Um, at prime, everything in the organization is in balance. You're in a situation where you're at your maximum efficiency for the organization. Organizations begin with what we call courtship. Courtship is when an entrepreneur tries to find money and actually sort of goes out, borrows money, visits banks, etc., and starts off. We then move into infancy go-go, up through adolescence, and into prime. And just a quick note here, most stable companies who have revenues, whether they be a million dollars or significant revenues, most stable companies get into trouble and either fail or fail to go further up the life cycle between go-go and adolescence, and I'll explain that a little bit later. You move to prime, into the fall, through aristocracy, recrimination, and I'm going to go through these a little bit later, through bureaucracy, and then obviously into death or bankruptcy. The interesting thing is on the life cycle, on the aging side, once you get down to kind of recrimination through to bureaucracy, unless you're a strategically significant organization, such as the airlines or the banks, or several years ago, GM, Chrysler, etc., your only saviour is the American or the British or the European taxpayer because there's no way back from that area between recrimination and bureaucracy for a normal company. So, how do you actually manage your way through those various life cycle stages? Well, it would appear that if you actually get all the books that have ever been written about management and actually filter them down there's really only four roles that any company needs to provide to actually become a high-performing organization. So now I'm going to go quickly through those four roles. The four roles are, number one, you have to produce results. And I'm very specific about this because what it says is you produce the results for which the company was originally established. And it's interesting, I think Jean-Claude Dio said this morning in, in his presentation that he wanted to move through a change structure without actually losing the reason for why his organization was originally in existence. 
If you produce the results, you become effective as an organization. And I can actually illustrate that with a quick story. If you imagine five people start on a hike one morning, about 10 o'clock, and they're out in the valley and they're climbing up the hills, and by the time they get to about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they're actually in a situation where they're all walking single file, and they walk around the corner, and there's a big rock on the side of the hill. What happens is they can't move to the left of it because they're in a situation where the cliff is there, they can't move to the right because the valley. And so what they have to do is work together to actually solve that particular problem. And in a sense, that's when management comes into play. Because they systematize, they organize, they delegate, etc., to solve the problem. And I think one of the things that I noticed this morning with several of the presentations was the fact that you all have rocks in your business, and you're actually trying to work out a way in which you can move some of those rocks. The problem is that when you get to a situation where there's more than four or five people or 10 people who can actually touch the rock, when you've got maybe 100, 500 people, 5,000 people in the organization, the rock actually moves away from understanding in the sense that a lot of people actually don't know what the rock within the business is. So you produce results, you become effective. The second one is administering the business. If you do that, you become efficient. Now what this means, in America you have this phrase called running a tight ship. It's getting the right things in the right place at the right time. If you do that, you become efficient as an organization. I just want you to note that these two, the first two, P and A, they actually provide effectiveness and efficiency in the short term for an organization. The third one is to entrepreneur the business, and if you do that, you become proactive. So what does the E-role actually provide within an organization? Well, what that does is it actually allows you to think about what's going to happen tomorrow and change your business today. So it's kind of like risk management, because companies require to change, but they don't know what the future looks like to 100%. So what they actually do is they have to take a risk. And that's what the E-role is. Can anybody tell me what the definition of entrepreneurialism without risk is called? It's called consulting. <laughs> the final role is to integrate the business. And by doing that, you actually become organic. Now, what do I mean by that quickly? Organic companies actually have an interdependence amongst the organization and amongst the players themselves. And that's because there's an interdependency. Think of it like a hand. If I break one of my fingers, the hand still operates because it's interdependent. If I take the leg off a chair, the chair will fall down because it's mechanistic. So you have organic organizations where when the part of the organization gets into trouble, let's say those idiots in sales, that's a mechanistic cultural response to what's going on in the, in, in the sector or the business. Organic companies, we have a problem in sales, how are we going to help them out? We have a problem down in operations, what are we all going to do to work together to solve the particular problems? So. The other interesting thing is, and I wouldn't, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but over the years, the integration role provides significant competitive advantage. Because if you get that right, people can copy your strategy. They can't copy your culture. So if you think of successful companies, I always use the example of Southwest uh, in, in America. They actually are totally, almost totally organic because they spend a lot of time developing their cultural attitudes. It's interesting because Southwest actually spend as much time hiring a warehouse manager as they do hiring a pilot, because they actually work on the basis and assumption that they hire people assuming they've got the basic skills to do what they want to do, and they then try to get them to fit over time into the culture. In most American organizations, and increasingly worldwide, people are hired for what they know, 
and they're fired for what, who they are. And good companies reverse that process. So that's the integration rule. They can be measured, I'm not going to go into too much detail, producing results, that's about um, customer retention. It's not about profitability, because profitability is a snapshot of success at any one particular time. So customer retention would be there. Um, that's efficiency in the way you run your business. New products, new markets to be developed, which is obviously something that this industry is going through at the moment. And integration, it's basically about who wants into your company and who wants out, whether it's employees, customers, or whatever else it happens to be. So that's a measure of, for the integration rule. Sorry, wrong one. I'm not going to go through this too much, but I, I recommend to clients who work with us that every six months or 12 months, no later than 12 months, you ought to have this on your management executive team agenda for at least a one meeting. What are the factors within your organization that increase the commitment of all your team members to the cause, the rock you're trying to move? And what are the factors you're trying to decrease? So, sorry, I can't come up with a good acronym, but P-A-E-I, in balance, equals prime. So, what does the prime organization look like? It's effective and efficient in the short term, and it's effective and efficient in the long term. And the prime organization, if you can do it, you'll consistently meet or exceed revenue and profitability targets and be the benchmark for the industry. If you're a public company, investors will want to have your stock. And if you're a private company, then phantom stock and everything else, everybody wants to take a share in it. The best people in the industry will want to work with you, and clients will want to work with you, and you'll dominate the markets. And here's the important words. You'll dominate the markets you choose to be in. So let's have a look at the four roles and see where they dominate at various stages in the life cycle. And again, this is proven in practice in organizations all over the world. So in courtship, the dominant role is obviously the E-role because it's in the mind of the entrepreneur that's trying to establish the business. As we move up into infancy, the E-role tends to take a back seat because the all-important thing in the P-role is to produce the results. It's about cash. It's about going out and getting customers, etc. In GoGo, the P-role is added to the E-role. And why is that? Because in GoGo, -Go, and you can look at many of the technology companies at the moment, what happens is you need the E-role, the entrepreneurial role, to kick back in because obviously you need new products, new marketplaces, etc., to expand the business. In adolescence, the P actually tends to subside just a fraction and that's primarily because you've now got a stable marketplace. You might be number two or three in the market. The interesting thing is that the A role, the administration role, starts to come back in. And the reason why most companies fail between GoGo -Go and adolescence is purely because of the A role, which causes conflict internally within the organization as the business tries to systematize everything that it's actually putting in place. So this is where processes come in. This is where, um, for example, a company like DHL, which was highly entrepreneurial, when I was worldwide head of restructuring, a whole team of what we would call professional managers came in to actually try to systematize the business before it was sold to Deutsche Post. At the go-go and the adolescent stage, you have these two concepts called the founder's trap and divorce. I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but think of it this way. The entrepreneur that has developed the business up through infancy and go-go all of a sudden thinks, well, this is fantastic, I'm brilliant, and I know what I'm doing, so I'm going to go out and let somebody else run the business. This can be small companies, it can be large companies. Think of Howard Schultz over at uh, Starbucks. Michael Dell at Dell Computers. They let somebody else come in to run the business, and then after a couple of years, they go, 
this person was a moron, I've got to take the company back, and then they come back in and they think no one else can run the business like they do. That's the founder's trap, and divorce is similar, but tends to happen in things like professional services firms, where partners just part their ways. And that's why most companies fail. So, we then get to the fall. What happens there? Well, the first thing to go, because you now have, you've gone through Prime, you go through, um, the, the loss of the e-roll because there's lots of cash, revenues are fantastic, and you've actually moved through Prime, but you're sort of getting fat, dumb, and happy. Prime, you'll see, everything is in balance. The reason why the i-roll, the integration role, becomes less important is simply because there's so much mutual trust and respect amongst the management team and the staff and the people that you don't have to rely on the integration role so much as part of a process within the organization. It becomes endemic. Aristocracy, well, you can see the P role is declining, the E role is declining, the I role has declined, it becomes pure, almost pure A, which is what happened to companies like GM, uh, Microsoft to some ex extent. There's no way back up the curve. In order to get from aristocracy, and I'm gonna ask you where you think you might be on the life cycle as an industry and as a company, in order to get from aristocracy to go-go, to back onto the growing side, you've gotta start thinking like a go-go company. You've gotta actually start thinking like a, disrupt a disruptive influence on your own business. Recrimination, everybody for himself. There's virtually no sales. The entrepreneurial spirit is gone. Um, that's typical of GM four or five years ago when they went from 10 years ago controlling, I think it was 80% of the US domestic car market to less than 18% when they went bankrupt. Bureaucracy, and then finally death. Ask yourselves these questions about whether you're on the growing side of the curve or the aging side of the curve. Everything is permitted unless specifically forbidden. Everything is forbidden unless specifically permitted. Get what we want, want what we get. That's a very interesting thing because high growth companies regularly fail to meet their corporate expectations because they think they might get 30% but they only get 25%. Aging companies know they can get five, but go for three, because then all the executives can get their bonuses. Expectations exceed results. Results exceed expectations. Political power is in sales and marketing. Political power is in accounting, finance, and legal. People are kept for their contribution despite their personality. And in the aging company, People are kept for their personality despite their contribution. You control the system, the system controls you. Problems are seen as opportunities, opportunities are seen as problems. So ask yourself those questions. Now I'm gonna quickly scan through these, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there's a series of boxes on both sides of this chart. And so when you have a look at the uh, presentation afterwards, play it as a presentation, because if you print it, you'll just end up with 30 boxes on the, on the page. On the aging, on the growing side, there's normal characteristics that you would expect at that stage in the life cycle, and there's abnormal characteristics which become pathological if you don't solve them before you get to the next stage in the life cycle. So in courtship, organizations not born, much excitement, it's all about the future. Abnormal, organization can die before it's born because there's no energy. Infancy, birth, sell, sell, sell. Abnormal, organization makes one big error, a customer goes bust, you go bankrupt. Go-go, spreads itself too thin, Everything in GoGo -Go is about opportunity. Let's go into this market, let's develop this product. There's lack of focus. Abnormal, 
That's why the founder's trap happens, because the organisation remains a one-man show, one-person show. Adolescent, conflict between those who want to preserve what they have and those who want change and are ready for more risk and growth. It can be very inconsistent, the goals are not clear. People want more sales, they incentivise people to do things and it produces low margin. And then that's the abnormal prime. The organisation is results oriented, follows systems, has plans and follows them. I'm going to quickly skip through the rest so that we can finish. You'll notice that on the ageing side there are no normal behaviours. Everything is abnormal. The organisation's bankrupt. So, thank you very much. Um, I'll answer any questions. <laughs>